Well, hello everybody. Um, I've been uh, promising to do a tips and tricks video for quite a while. A couple of you guys have asked me to do this, uh, try to consolidate all the various tips and tricks I've learned over the years um, into one video, so I'm going to try to do that today. And then at the same time update uh, what's been going on with my Dovi, since a few people have asked about that as well. So a couple things, um, I've got my wife holding the camera right now, and she's not going to want to stay here very long, so I'll try to make this part brief. Um, but uh, just remember, these are just things that I've done over the years. I've been doing this for 40 plus years. You may have better ways to do it. Um, these are just things that have worked for me. Um, if you've got some ideas about other tips and tricks or uh, improvements on the ones I show, uh, just leave them in the comments, and then everybody can benefit from it um, as time goes by. So first thing I thought I'd show you is how I feed my baby fish. And what I typically do is I take some high quality pellet food. In this particular case I'm going to use Hikari Bio Gold Plus. And I've got my little handy dandy mortar and pestle. And um, I just simply grind it up into real fine powder. I find this is much better quality than the food you can buy is, you know, fry food and what have you, and I can kind of customize it depending on the species that I'm working with. Now it doesn't take very long, you just grind it up like that in the in the little dealy bob here. Yeah, My wife says it doesn't show, but you get the idea. I also use jumbo krill for that, grinding it up, and then um, I also have used uh, New Life Spectrum cichlid food. All these things are real good foods to start your fish with. Um, so then I just take the uh, ground up into powder stuff and I put it in a cup and then I'm going to trot out over to some of the fry that I have. For today we're going to just feed these convict fry that are over here. My back might get in the way but I'll try to stay sideways. As you can see I've got convict fry of two different sizes. This pair has got some fry that are about a week younger than this pair. But um, they're both uh, about the right size for the powder that I've ground up. The other thing I didn't mention is, you know, you can grind the powder up to various degrees of fineness depending on how big the fish are that you're going to feed. Uh, as the fry get older, you can make the powder a little bit uh, bigger. So then I just use a turkey baster and... Um, Put it in and uh, just throw the rest of it away, which usually I clean it up right away, but uh, this time since we're doing a video, I'll just leave it there. So then as you might be able to see, the uh, various fry are now picking on the stuff. So with that, I will let my wife leave because I know she probably would prefer it that way. Thank you, Anne, for doing that, and then we'll continue the video um, with some of the other stuff. And this is Alice, who's been dying to get on camera for a while. She's uh, been on camera a few times in the past, but she's our 12-year-old kitty, and um, she's a pain in the butt, but, you know, what can you do? So anyway, so let's see. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is when you do water changes, it's really important um, to try to make sure you're doing the same volume every time. So what I've done with my tanks is I put tape along the tanks. So I can be very consistent, and each one of these tape measuring marks is for a different volume of water. Uh, this is a 20% water change, this is a 50%, and that's 75%. Now normally I do 50, but uh, okay, uh, nowadays, in the old days, I would do a 20% change basically every day, um, five days a week, and then I'd do 150 and 175. I kind of because of the water prices and some other reasons, I've kind of backed off on that a little bit, but uh, I still do the water changes enough to keep the fish very healthy. And in this particular tank, which is one of the 600s, um, I've got, uh, this is my Amphilophus tank, with my chanchos and the Red Devils and what have you. This is a very nice pair of chanchos. And this also houses my last uh, Dovi, which again people have asked for an update on, so we're going to take a look at him. Um, he is uh, probably three years old now. Um, of course, he is the last remaining uh, 
son of my massive 27-inch Dovi that I had for about, I don't know, 13, 14 years before he passed here a few years ago. This particular Dovi is 20-plus uh, inches. He's probably, uh, it's hard to say, he's 20 inches, uh, maybe a little more. Um, and again, he's about three years old. And this Dovi is probably the least aggressive and most timid Dovi that I've ever had. He's got spectacular color, and um, he's three years old, more or less, like I said. Uh, but he is not uh, nearly as aggressive as any of the other ones that I've had. Um, not sure the exact reason for that. Most likely it's just personality traits. You know, fish are a lot like people. They're maybe not quite as plastic as people, but they do have some variable traits. And on a scale of 1 to 10 for Dovi aggression, this one's probably in the 2 or 3 range. Um, he does totally control this tank. Um, he has inhibited uh, these chanchos from spawning as well as the various red devils and what have you. There's, there's plenty of room in this tank for them to spawn, but uh, because this big guy's in here, um, every time somebody sets up shop to spawn, he kind of um, takes over that area and just doesn't let it happen. But as you can see, he's quite a beauty, um, and uh, I don't know what else I can say about him, but he's doing very well, and um, that's, that's about all we'll talk about him on. Um, the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is lighting. Um, each one of my tanks, or each the two different rooms, I should say, these are my older tanks. I've had these set up in here you know, probably since 1990 or so, and um, I, I wanted to have not particularly bright lighting in here. Cichlids don't really need bright lighting. In fact, they do their best when the lighting's a little dim. So I've tried to replicate as best I can sort of, a, you know, the sun coming in and sort of that uh, wavy pattern you can get from the water with light going through. And I've just used a couple of uh, cheap little strip lights on top, you know, the standard L, um, uh, fluorescent lights. And above it, I've got what used to be fluorescents. They're now just LEDs. And um, I use, uh, I leave one of these on at night, uh, just kind of for a moonlight effect. But the rest go off. Um, you'll also notice that these tanks are pretty high in the air. They're probably, uh, well, let's see, I'm about six foot five, and this thing is up to my shoulder. It's about almost six, maybe five and a half, six feet tall. And again, I've found that uh, with the cichlids, the higher you can put your tanks and the dimmer the light, the more at ease they are and the more they're likely to come out, um, feel relaxed, spawn, dis you know, display, what have you. So um, that's that. Uh, another thing that I've done over the years is I've put in power heads on a lot of these tanks just for the extra circulation. The air stones and and the like didn't don't really do so well with cichlids. They usually tear the air stones apart and make a mess. So I found a long time ago that it's best if you're going to do something like that to use power heads. And what I've done with the power heads that I use is I have cut out old pieces of sponge from old um, Hagen AquaClear filters and various filters I've had over the years, and I put the sponge attached to the uh, you know the intake of the power heads. And it becomes another filtration device that keeps the water, you know, a little bit more bacteria filtration, keeps the water clear, and I rinse them out uh, once a week when I do the water changes. Um, so that's a kind of an additional way to add a little bit more filtration. And again, I think that the powerheads are a much better solution for oxygenation and water movement in these big uh, bruisers tanks than is an air stone type of scenario. And over here, um, you can see I've done the same thing in this other 600, with the, again with the power head and the um, sponge filter. This is my other 600 gallon tank. Um, it has the Festi, there's a female over there. Uh, it's got Atromaculata, it's got a lot of green terrors. And um, there's my, my male, Festi, if he would uh, turn around, uh, you might, there you go. He's going to go head off into the hiding spot. The other thing I try to do um, for most of these cichlids to keep them at ease is to provide plenty of hiding places. And you need to provide hiding places that are of various sizes. So, for example, that big cave is where my 
massive male dove I used to live, and it was plenty, you know, obviously he could fit in there, barely uh, once he got full grown, but some of these other little pots and things, um, other fish, like the female dovi when I was spawning, could survive, or the fry. So it's important, and what I've done in this tank, I've added more clay pots as I've added more fish. So there are a variety of clay pots and uh, big hunks of driftwood. This piece of driftwood is about four feet long, and there's plenty of places for them to hide, just lots of stones and what have you. So that's kind of um, another... Uh, uh, trick, I guess. I don't know. Trick, just something I do. I've done over the years. Um, so now we're going to head into the other room, the garage, the converted garage, and uh, of course this is where my thousand is. And this tanks, uh, this room I changed it a little bit differently. Um, here again are my Amphilophus red devils, uh, Midas, what have you. Um, these guys spawned. Uh, you know, there's the. The daddy, there's the male, and let's see, where's the, the female? The female is right there. Uh, but as you can see, some of her fry have outgrown her, and these red devils are only, gosh, I, I think they spawned this summer. Sorry for my finger, I keep putting it in the way. Um, but uh, this is a gregarious group, and I'm gonna, I've kind of decided to leave these all in here. They're just doing so well. There's 15, uh, the smaller ones, and the parents, which makes 17. And I got this old, tired female Monaguens. It's the last of the old fish in here. Um, then uh, we've got the male Umbi right there, the wild-caught one that has been producing fry. And then over here we got the female, and I don't know if you can notice, but along that wall is a ton of fry that uh, are growing uh, by eating the algae off the sides of the tank. And... Um, off of the various driftwood and what have you. It's almost dinner time for these guys. That's why they're uh, so anxious when they see me standing here. Uh, you know, they're, they're expecting to eat. Again, this tank is really high off the ground. This one is definitely at least six feet off the ground. It's a three feet tall tank. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so these fish are not shy in the least. I'm really happy with this last batch of uh, devils that were spawned. The, uh, coloration on these are spectacular they've got a lot of them are sl slowly changing from black to orange so they've got these modeled patterns some of them have some real deep red faces uh, one little gal over here is uh, yellow and um, you know there's just a whole host uh, of different colorations and sizes and shapes and uh, it's a very active really interesting tank so let's see let's move on um, over here uh, again, uh, one of the things that I've done a little differently in this tank is, or these tanks in the garage, is I changed my lighting to the um, um, T5s, uh, the high output type lighting, and I did that because we wanted to do a, something a little different, try something a little different, which I think's worked out pretty well too. Again, uh, dim lighting is really the best answer for these fish, but um, there's a couple ways you can do it, and my wife is a big avid gardener and she loves plants so to try to get her interested in this hobby a little bit I started I came up with the idea of putting potted plants on top of these tanks that's why I have the T5s because they need the extra lighting and um, you'll notice in here in fact that uh, some of the, t the plants are kind of in the uh, have migrated into the top surface of the water in uh, some of these aquariums in here and rather than have subdued lighting um, from just the light output, I have all these plants on top of the tanks, which um, subdues the lighting because, of course, the lights have to go through all the plants uh, to get to the water. This also provides the fish with some extra cover, and, um, you know, it helps, again, put them at ease. So that's, a, you know, a really good way to do it, especially if your wife is... Uh, or you, or anybody for that matter, and your family is really into plants, it might kind of help uh, do a couple, you know, a couple different hobbies at once. And again, in this tank now, we have a pair of, uh, this is yet another one of our cats, this is Arrow. He was a kitten last summer, along with his two siblings, Biscuit and uh, Cupcake. Again, he knows it's about dinner time, and when I feed these guys, the fish dinner, they usually get a little piece of krill or so, don't you, Arrow? Anyway, uh, this tank has a pair of uh, ornatums, 
and a pair of atromaculatums. And um, as you can see, the male ornatum has uh, been picking on the female here a bit. You can see she's got a rip here or there, uh, but she's in fine shape. Anyway, Arrow just jumped on top of his cat pole, uh, which is right next to the, uh, the big tank, because they typically jump on top of the tank, which he just did, uh, when it's time for feeding. And again, fish don't even care. Uh, big tank um, and lots of cover, so uh, they're pretty content. Uh, it doesn't seem to bother them. Um, then over here, I've done the same thing uh, with the lighting. Um, I've got the plants on top of the tanks. Uh, to try to keep, um, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, dif lighting diffuse and uh, make my wife happy with some plants and it keeps the fish happy with cover and stuff. In here we've got uh, uh, another red devil. This was an uh, earlier spawning from that same pair in the thousand. And uh, he's really an aggressive fish. A gorgeous mottled white and orange uh, Red Devil, and Simspilum, and the Grimodes, and a whole bunch of different uh, green terrors in here. So, um, yeah, that's it, Arrow. So I think, uh, I'm sure I've got some other tips and things, but I just can't think of any of them right now. Um, I hope, uh, oh, and a couple other things, um, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, temperature. We're looking at the uh, thousand from the end as opposed to from the front this time. So you're looking like through the 10 foot, you know, to the other side, which is 10 feet. Um, and all the red devils are down here waiting for me to, to feed them again. Um, temperature. Um, I typically keep the, uh, the fish at around 78 degrees. Um, in the summertime, I disconnect all the heaters. Seattle is not a particularly hot city, but it's uh, warm enough from, say, May 1st till October 1st that I just unplug all the heaters and uh, let the, uh, the water just, uh, you know, remain from the outside temperature and the thick uh, acrylic insulates, insulates it and what have you. Um, during that point of the year, sometimes uh, towards the uh, end of September, early October, the tank temperatures will dip to maybe 70, 72 degrees, and I find that's real helpful to the fish. It's better, in my opinion, for all these various cichlids to have a variable temperature over the year. Um, it, hard, it, it makes them much hardier, and um, it acclimates them to um, big water changes as well. And, you know, hardy fish uh, survive, the hard, less hardy ones don't. And over time, you end up, you know, breeding hardy fish to hardy fish, and the fry get even hardier. So um, it makes for really hardy fish uh, as time goes by. And then uh, when the winter comes, I plug the heaters back in, which they just got plugged in here. Uh, oh, uh, well, let's see. This is the 18th of October, I guess two, three weeks ago. And um, the extra heat now brings the temperatures up to that 78 to 80 range. And this is typically when I get most of my spawnings, although there's so many fish spawned already around here that uh, uh, hopefully I won't have too many more. So, um, gosh, that's about all I can think of at the moment, guys. Uh, I hope uh, you found this video interesting. And um, again, uh, if you've got some other tips uh, or tricks that uh, you've... You, oh, I do have one. More. See, I, I'll, I can go forever, but I, I've got another one. Um, one of the other things I've done in, in this room is uh, filtration-wise, if you're using canisters, I use uh, three or four canisters in each tank, and I do that because, one, you can clean one and leave the other two not clean, and then, you know, you've got to clean one all the time, and you don't lose any of your bi bacteria, biological filtration by doing that. What I did on this tank was a little different. I used this old Eheim, and... Um, I filled this with nothing but filter floss. And this tank is really just for mechanical filtration. It keeps the tank uh, crystal clear. And then once uh, about a month, I take all this filter floss out and um, replace it with fresh filter floss. The other filters in this tank, I don't do anything to because all they are is filled with biological filtration. Mostly the ceramic nodules at the bottom and then the uh, Eheim little... Um, 
uh, porous, uh, you know, circular, uh, little look like little mini baseballs that are an eighth of an inch long or, or you know, uh, the size. So, um, and with those, they just get better and better over the years. I haven't uh, changed the other filters in this tank for probably 15 years. And um, so I guess that's the last uh, one I could think of. So hopefully this uh, video was of value. And again, um, if you guys uh, have some other ideas about uh, things you've tried that other people might like, leave them in the comments below. And I will talk to you later.